After 25 years in the fashion industry, I've realized that fashion is not really about the clothes, it's about the people. I'm Laura Van Root Poole, and this is What We Wore. My friend's twin sisters, Lizzie and Catherine Fortunato, are celebrating 15 years in business this year, and we've been together most of the way. To fet these special two sisters, we're re-airing their episode from season one, which is one of the most beloved episodes of what we wore to date. Lizzie and Catherine Fortunato, I'm so excited that y'all are here. Thank you so much for coming all the way from New York to North Carolina to have this fantastic 10th anniversary celebration tonight. Before we get started, will you all tell the listeners a little bit about your collection and why you chose to celebrate your 10th anniversary here? Absolutely. I'll get started. I'm Lizzie Fortunato, uh, the designer of the line that I own with my twin sister, Catherine. We have been working with Pool Shop and with Laura almost the entire time we've been in business. So it's been a decade of support from her, and we're just so honored to be in a store that carries amazing designers and has such a loyal clientele and such vision. But as a side note, we are dookies. So <laughs> returning to the state that we spent four years of college in is really also a treat, and we always love coming down to the Raleigh-Durham area. I also just think that Laura, sort of in particular relative to a lot of the stores that we work with, really celebrates designers and artists who are known sort of for their mixed medium, for being a little bit adventuresome with their designs, for being colorful and happy and fun. And those are all adjectives that describe the Lizzie Fortunato collection. We're obviously so honored that she's championed the brand for so long, but we also feel like we're in really good company here at Pool Shop and Capital. You are, but it's never been hard to support you. So you girls are twins, and your parents, they, they didn't know they were having twins. Your mom didn't know. That's correct. <laughs> I mean, I, I have a 13-year-old, and I <laughs> I thought I had triplets in there. I mean, I had no <laughs> 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 So I, I, it sounds crazy now that she wouldn't have known, but actually it kind of makes sense. She, she didn't know. I mean, it's it's the type of thing that would probably not happen in 2018, <laughs> but it was 1984. We were She was in Delaware. She was healthy. She was young. Her sister had actually been born with some disabilities that at the time they didn't know if they were hereditary. It turns out they're not. However, she didn't really want to know anything going into it because she just didn't know what her options would be. So she figured, hey, I'm healthy. I feel great. I'm just going to do this. And then after I was born, the doctor said, you have another child inside of you. And then she Catherine came out. out? I, mean, like- I mean, she was so freaked out. But needless to say, when my brother was born two years later, she got every single test in the book. <laughs> I'm the, this is Catherine, and I'm the lovingly known as the bonus baby in the house. Although at the time, I think that my dad probably saw double tuitions and double of everything. And um, I think he's the one who passed out. Uh, well, I, my cousins are twins, and one of the daughters of the twins Twins, just had her second set of twins. Oh my gosh. I would die. That's, That's what I mean. <laughs> That's what I mean. I think everyone in our family was so surprised because there's no other twins in the family. So right. everyone was just shocked. When they rolled my mom out to the waiting room, she has a child under each arm. And the grandparents <laughs> honestly thought that she was like holding the woman next to her as baby because she was too sick to come out or something. And she was like, nope, they're both mine. And everyone was absolutely shocked. <laughs> were y'all teeny or was, was we were, I mean, we would have made a very respectably sized baby. So <laughs> we were like, Lizzie was low sixes and I was high fives. We would have been like a nice big <laughs> really? 12 pounder. So um, your mother. my mom said she was really sick the first trimester, but she didn't live in the helicopter system we live in these days where she was like I was really sick but it was my first time being pregnant I didn't know what to expect yeah oh my gosh did y'all dress the same did you do you remember we you know it's actually I think maybe a credit to my parents that they did not dress us too similarly and I think the reason that that is been a benefit to us now is because we were really encouraged to be different people so of course she got plenty of gifts that were matching and color-coded and all of that so I guess occasionally she couldn't help but to impress the grandparents and aunts and uncles with matching outfits but in general (laughs) they really let us be our own people and that extended to academics and sports and hobbies and I think that's what has allowed Lizzie and uh, me to be both best friends and co-workers today is that we don't compete with each other because we really excel in different areas. I would love to meet your mother. Oh I've, my gosh, I've, it seems we, so we overdue. We say that she needs to come down here because she would be a very happy capital client. <laughs> and just another very strong, impressive individual. She's the first yeah. female president of the Campbell Soup Foundation. Right. And we get a lot of our style from her and from her mother, who is no longer with us, but was an incredible sort of 
maternal our maternal grandmother was just an incredible sort of style icon in our lives and I think inspired Lizzie a lot in her early creative days and did you y'all grew up in Delaware and did was your grandmother nearby about two hours away in Pennsylvania okay. so close enough that we had a very close relationship she was the only lady in like Amish country Pennsylvania who was this insane Francophile so glamorous <laughs> would wear like a chignon and speak French and uh. you know she she was very worldly for her years and where she lived she's uh continues to be I think a, whenever we put together a really good outfit we say that's a NAMA outfit what, what so. was it Nam- NAMA NAMA N-A-M-A. N-A-M-A. I love yeah, it yeah I think we couldn't say grandma so it's NAMA, <laughs> NAMA but it stuck and so did your mom your mom worked growing up and- she, she didn't work growing up so she was trained as a lawyer and worked till we were maybe three or so and then from then until you know age 20 she was a very not 20 professional mom 18 yeah, you we know were in, we were late teens high school. she was a very full-time mom and she was a wonderful and continues to be the most amazing mom we're so close and we travel together and hang out all the time but she went back to work when we went to a way to, to do to school and she has like really thrived and has yeah. had some incredible positions and her position now has just like led her all over the country and she's worked with Michelle Obama and her Let's Move campaign and on different amazing food initiatives throughout the country. So she's really like at the foremost of her field and um, she's definitely a, a badass. Yeah. Well, I, I, same thing, a little bit happened to me, not in the same way, but my mother went back to work when I went to boarding school and I remember my dad <laughs> was so not supportive. <laughs> it's not funny, but he, he really, he was like, what are, what am I supposed to do it for dinner? Totally. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Our parents got divorced. Yeah. <laughs> Is that podcast appropriate? Yeah. Yeah. But no, it's true. I mean, how relevant of a conversation this day and age yeah. where we're surrounded by a lot of, especially in New York, really strong females who take their careers very seriously. And I think that's been a huge part of fulfillment in my mom's life in the last 20 years. And my mom, while she had been a full-time mom for so many years, was also still really engaged. Like yeah. She was on the board of so many things. She was so involved with our school. She was like always doing stuff. So I think when you're a young kid, like a lower middle schooler, you don't like realize oh my mom's not like in a corporate world because she was still out doing stuff so I was like oh yeah my mom's always like busy working (laughs) she wasn't the breadwinner but she was definitely like very busy working doing productive things she she wasn't like a tennis country club (laughs) mom all day and she she did like do some of that too but she wasn't that wasn't her life yeah same same with Mm -hmm. my mom yeah and I think that obviously that planted a lot of the fundamentals of sort Mm -hmm. of how we operate today but it is funny, all going back to work, sort of, I mean, she maybe beat us to the punch a few uh, a few years earlier, but now the playing field, especially like in terms of how we dress, in terms of how we approach work, and just kind of our lifestyle, it's so funny, you transition from being like a mother-daughter, which we still have, to just also being really good friends. Yeah. And so now at, you know, the respective ages of 35 and early 60s, like, we want to buy the same things online we want to share each other's Nicholas Kirkwood shoes for the (laughs) office we want like we really all of a sudden have hit this tempo in our life where she jokes she makes so much fun of us because Lizzie and I love a good Demi Lee sweater Mm -hmm. and my mom will always be like I love your sweater and she's like do not tell me you got that at a Demi Lee sample sale why do you never take me to these things (laughs) she does not live in New York she lives in Wilmington Delaware and um has great fashion and you know could definitely could beat us on a closet competition <laughs> any day but she is really funny because Lizzie will send her a new brand or a new thing online Lizzie sent her a link to these cool shoes the other day that Lizzie just thought were aspirational and my mom wrote back after five minutes and was like thanks so much Got just em. bought them <laughs> yeah. I was like mom excuse me I was nice. gonna get them so. but then I texted her and I was like well I'll try yours and wear them a few times to decide if I want to buy them <laughs> we're all right. the same, same yeah size we're like shoes. all the same size More shoes and yeah. we borrow a lot from her growing up we adopted some bags from her and some jackets and yeah. she definitely influenced our style and she was always very put together nothing like too crazy but always just like looked very very good. classic very yeah, a classic. very very classic yeah. dresser mm-hmm. i think i get my love for you know a good blazer a good tailor pant from my mom yeah <laughs> but, but, um, it had to come from somewhere exactly yeah. it definitely had she to come actually from wears a lot more high heels than we do now like uh. she's always in amazing heels for work and she obviously well, works she in a little? more corporate environment she's not she's um, way tall she's, she's like tall. five eight. Yeah, yeah yeah and but she's like great heels and also the stamina for it all day and I was she like, drives Whoa. and we live in new york where you're on True. cobblestone streets and subways and you're yeah not so that's a big heels. difference your high heels are in your purse good at point all times. yeah i want to hear more about your grandmother yeah definitely. so our in her so, style totally and actually it's cool because both of our grandmothers had distinct influences and they were different but they were both really impactful so our mom's mom nama first name hope she 
had all of the incredible sort of fashion inspiration. She she subscribed to W Magazine well into wow. her seventies. She would cut out articles and in her beautiful script send them to us and truly knew more about yeah designers probably when we were in middle school and high school than we did because to us that was a new yeah, world she really followed fashion like very closely like she wouldn't knew, know when a designer had changed houses or something and mention it to us and i'll be like i didn't even know that was, was happening so she and she was in pennsylvania in pennsylvania in, in, in the middle rural pennsylvania wow. in the middle but of born nowhere and raised in in forest hills in, right. in yeah. new york <laughs> from and new york and had the coolest house i mean we really like when my mom finally sold my grandparents' house, Kath and I reaped the benefit of that because she would go to these furniture shows in New York and just buy, like, the craziest stuff. You know, she had this amazing bright orange, beautiful, I think it was, like, Italian or something sofa and these awesome wall hangings that I've Mid -century, inherited Mid-century, but of. with a not cliche mid-century twist. I mean, a <laughs> yeah. beautiful outdoor sculptures. I mean, she was both an outdoors woman and an avid skier and a hmm. hiker and loved her dogs. But then also, like I said, could wear her hair in a chignon and play classical piano and was just sort of this – I mean, she really was elegant. And she actually – I remember a story where she went back to, I don't know, a 20 or 30 or 40 year – I think it was more than that. College reunion at Connecticut College where <laughs> right. she graduated from. And the girls who were maybe our age now in their 30s were just flocking her and saying, please tell us what you do to your skin because <laughs> you couldn't possibly be the class of whatever it was. <laughs> Yeah, 1930. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, she she was just embodied this elegance and really, really showed inner beauty inside and out because she was truly beautiful, but also just had this personality and spirit that um, was stylish and inspiring from but that perspective. But she was really chic. Like, she, like, people would always say, like, oh, she's the best dressed woman in the room. And, like, she would spend money on clothes, but then she would also be thrifty at other times. And she was, like, doing high-low before high-low was even cool. Like, she <laughs> Absolutely. Would, she I would... think when she didn't have much money was when she had some of her best, best fashion coups. Yeah. I yeah. mean, to buy a long tunic and then spend all of your budget on like Lizzie was saying, beaded just cuff. the beaded cuff was the most oh. remarkable thing. And the fancy bejeweled woman at this particular event that she was dressing for were all gushing over her outfit. And of course, you know, it was the least expensive outfit in the room. So that. she was sort of thrifty and resourceful and stylish. And it came from a very authentic place. Our dad's grandmother is truly not stylish at all. <laughs> uh, but we love her so much. And Aww. Granny is still with us. And Granny is amazing because she... She's a very savvy Italian grandmother. She doesn't own a computer and yet still will like day trade Apple stocks. Like she'll call <laughs> her investment professional and is like, can you please trade this Apple? And they're like, Marion, you are way too old for that kind of volatility in your portfolio. And she's like, I'm old, so it truly doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, so Granny is just pretty sassy. And it's funny because she'll kind of give everybody a hard time. But when it comes to Lizzie and me, she and uh, Lizzie and I have a really fantastic relationship. Oh. And she kind of gets it. I mean, she was involved in our grandfather's construction company and she always, sort of always kept the books and sort of knew about business. And so she would um, – we'll kind of talk to her about – you know, HR problems or building yeah. team or growth problems. And she totally understands and can kind of listen to us and cut to the chase and give advice in a surprisingly meaningful way huh. for an 80-something-year-old who has never worked in fashion and still doesn't own a computer. I mean, it's it's a That's remarkable. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So it kind She's of very cuts, with it. cuts generations that way. My, my um, grandmother ran my grandfather's construction that company. That is so amazing. Yeah. <laughs> That's so I love cool. That. I yeah. love that. Yeah. She's really, she's extremely supportive. And actually, it's funny because she's not getting enough credit. She does beautiful handiwork and needlepoint. And in the very, very beginning, some of our designs had some of Granny's needlepoint involved in them. Like she was doing sort of like patchwork on necklaces that Lizzie would then sew together into these huge statement necklaces. Cool. So early on, Bergdorf Goodman placed a big order for this patchwork necklace and so we went ahead and bought all the embroidery and all these canvas panels and we're like granny we need you to make 25 of these panels you know in a month and granny gets the package in the mail and she calls us and she's like girls i just really don't like this neon color and we're like granny it does not matter whether you like the neon color bergdorf goodman likes the neon color please she, make was, she was trying to That's change amazing. it she still makes for us she just made me amazing cross-stitched straps for like a vintage wood uh, luggage rack Ugh. and it was the same thing I was like choosing colors like it has like this cool graphic pattern we like found a pattern together and I was choosing colors she's like I don't approve of your color choices <laughs> I was like granny you have very different <laughs> styles me, me. <laughs> very very different styles but it's kind of remarkable that despite all of that from a sort of business and savvy and technical and obviously 
granddaughter, grandmother loving perspective, she's played this incredible role. And I think it was like a maybe a 75th birthday present. Lizzie and I actually made a press book for her of all the clippings from Lizzie Fortunato that either mentioned her or wow. had a piece or had a piece inspired by her because so much lot, of the yeah. early really technical handiwork came from what Granny had taught us. What's your first fashion memory as children? I first wanted to be a cartoon animator. So that was my first introduction to the art world. I really was obsessed with cartoons. I collected cells and was obsessed with drawing cartoons. And I remember maybe in fifth or sixth grade telling my mom that the part about cartooning that I loved the most was drawing the characters' outfits. So I thought I should go (laughs) to sewing class. I love it. At which point she signed me up for a class that was about all 65-year-old women and one 13-year-old. That was me. (laughs) Um, So I learned to sew. I made my prom dresses and did all of that and sewed a lot with my grandmothers. Then I also just have pretty early memories of having like a pretty distinct style um I think it was maybe both have distinct style (laughs) well I don't know how good it was back then but it was but I was stubborn about it I was stubborn about it yes for (laughs) sure so in fourth grade I it was a white poet's blouse and bright yellow jeans and I wore them like day in and day out yeah I think they were I don't know if they were guests they were probably guests I just remember the um, the bright yellow jeans and like I wore that outfit so much and I just like felt like I could conquer the world in it that's a good question. I Class? think there were like cowgirl boots with it. Oh. Oh, there were a lot of cowgirl <laughs> but boots. There was, a, there was a particular, again, fourth grade, so mid-90s colonial Williamsburg field trip where it was like oh my God. Six, 50 degrees outside and we were learning to churn butter and every kid was in there, you know, Patagonia <laughs> fleece and khaki pants. And Lizzie was wearing a skirt that our parents had just brought her back from France and had to spend the entire field trip inside because she was, was not cold. adequately dressed. Oh, yeah, I was freezing. <laughs> but she but looked, I looked good. She looked amazing. <laughs> She looked amazing. Yeah, yeah. The colonial women were like, oh, I love that. <laughs> it, was, it was such a good skirt. And I, I actually do remember my mom saying, you shouldn't wear that. And I was like, come hell or high water, I'm wearing this skirt on this field trip. And I'm going to look good. But I froze. <laughs> exactly. Fashion at any cost. Yeah. Do you remember anything you made in the sewing classes? I made, oh, it was like so basic. I can remember like a brown and white plaid dress that looked like something from 1950. I remember doing a lot of like taking apart stuff that my mom had made, mm. had bought me and remaking it, which didn't thrill her. But I was always like adding like weird <laughs> pockets to things and um, like cutting apart denim and like repurposing it. So yeah, I definitely remember stuff I made. It's not things I'm particularly proud of now, although the prom dress that I made was good I ha- still you, have that what did you study in school I mean it's interesting I, I'm just so interested that you started being that connected to yeah fabric, I always love like clothing. tactile things I yeah. studied English and art history and really thought I like wanted to write I loved writing I loved studying English had internships at magazines throughout college and stuff but was always making things on the side and mm-hmm. so when I got to New York having already been making jewelry at Duke and kind of laying the groundwork for a business there when I moved up to New York I was working in fashion PR briefly but had a lot of friends who had entered the magazine industry and said you know I know you were make jewelry and like at that point it was kind of like a nights and weekends thing but they said my editor is working on a blue story if you could like messenger a blue necklace over maybe huh. I can try and get it in the magazine and I was like messenger I have like five dollars for my name I'll <laughs> drop it off at the Hearst at the Hearst messenger office at like 7 a.m. before I go to my real job and but was so that like a production issue and that like you w- it would have been clothing if you had been able to produce oh, that but um, like how, was that's a good question um I, I, think I, I think at some point I just kind of like got over the clothing thing I think at the time I thought oh like making clothing seems like it would take too long I'll just make (laughs) strings and beads instead but little did I know that now everything (laughs) is so laborious and takes forever so I I don't know that that argument still holds but um Lizzie puts together and takes apart a necklace you know 14 or 15 times in the initial sampling process and it's you know still in the in our 30s 10 years in you know, three in the morning when she gets her best sampling done. So the idea that she wanted to do jewelry because it was somehow speedier (laughs) or more efficient than making a garment is completely... I think I also got to the point where I loved the idea of an accessory being able to change an outfit. I can remember, like, finding cool beads or, like, making a little headband or something and thinking, like, okay, I can, like, wear that same yellow jeans and white poet's (laughs) blouse but, like, accessorize it, and now it's suddenly a different outfit. And that kind of stuck, and then it just grew pretty organically from there did you have was your mother into jewelry I mean did you have a real connection to jewelry as a young person not terribly I mean she bought us jewelry like she bought us special things at different occasions and she wore cool accessories but nothing you know out of like out of the ordinary yeah I think almost the ultimate irony when we were starting is that we're pretty 
low maintenance girls in the sense <laughs> that we're not dripping in jewels and we're not uh, we're not uh, we were never like lustful jewelry people yeah. who mm-hmm. wanted you know gemstones Definitely. or something like that yeah so the irony was that for girls who like you know work 12 hours days and run around new york city to, we're, we're not fussy but i actually think the beauty in that is communicating that jewelry doesn't need to be fussy and it could be part of an outfit just like your favorite sweater or your favorite clog or something like that could be yeah i feel like outfit. i thought about it more as just like changing an outfit as opposed to like okay here's that last thing that you put on like when I think about my jewelry it's the first first thing thing, I put on and I'm like okay I need a cool like printed skirt and a black t-shirt and I'm good to go and then it really becomes like the center of my outfit so I don't know I, I think Catherine's right I never thought about it like I need to you know be dolled up and have that last layer do you remember the first piece you made oh my gosh they have made so many I don't I don't know if I remember the first. I remember in high school going to bead stores in Philadelphia where you could, you know, design your own jewelry and buying beads and, like, having some pretty simple beaded necklaces that I would, like, labor over and wear day in and day out. There was one that had, like, pastel green beads on it, but I don't know. There were a lot. Before we started working with metalsmiths and doing sort of the technical level we have now, there was a lot of more laborious seed beating like Lizzie right. was saying and don't you remember some of those amazing rope earrings that like you would yeah but those weren't the first I think cool. that was more college level as opposed to high school because I definitely was going to bead stores in high school and stringing beads and I don't know it's amazing when we have high school but mainly college friends who pull out their Lizzie Fortunato <laughs> archives <laughs> well that's I want to hear about that actually I'm so fast I went to Chapel Hill UNC right mm-hmm. next door I, I don't think of Duke as being particularly um, accessorized. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Fashionable. Exactly. exactly. So tell me well, what, we had no competition. What was, <laughs> <laughs> what was that like? I, I, you're not from up north, but you're Delaware is mid-Atlantic. Sure. But what was that like coming to the south? And were people more accessorized? Were people? First of all, we're all freshmen in college. So looking back, you see, you know, tank tops and fashion <laughs> that should absolutely never be repeated. <laughs> um, but that might be a reflection of being college age no matter where you are. Right. With that said, I do think that... There was this appreciation for the fact that Lizzie and I would deck ourselves out in her creations. So go to like a formal or, you know, a party and have on a really cool pair of earrings or a statement necklace. And credit to the girls around us. They took notice and they said, you know, I've never seen anything like that. Can I borrow a necklace? Can I buy a pair of earrings for my, you know? But to Laura's point, Duke is not the most fashionable place. And I think unlike some Southern schools where you walk in and you're kind of like wowed by these women who dress like I really mean, well for a college student. Have you ever student. been to Ole Miss? I mean, yeah, exactly. I've never oh, been, but I can only imagine. Can only imagine. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So it wasn't anything like that where we walked in and we were like, whoa, these people are really <laughs> dressed and like they look so different. Like for the most part, people dressed like across the board right. not that well. Right. <laughs> well, it's also a sportier school yeah. and all of that. And well, did your people, style change when you got to Duke? When, it didn't you... change that much when we got there. It changed a lot in the years right after. Yeah. <laughs> like, I think when we it moved only to got New York, better when we when left. When we moved to yeah. New York, it, like, matured a lot. I think even though people didn't necessarily have amazing style, there were a lot of girls who were used to shopping, who had right. gone to malls in high school. Sure. And being in Durham, there was nothing to buy. Right. <laughs> so even if they didn't have great style, like, the fact that we were hosting a trunk show and selling cool earrings for $50 was like, oh, great, let's go shopping. So these girls who were used to a sh- kind of shopping culture suddenly were, like, a very captive audience right. for us. And, and you literally, you had your first trunk show in the dorm room. It wasn't <laughs> in, in the dorm room. It was in a, um, well, so we were making everything in the dorm room, and then Catherine was. The two of y'all were making it? Uh, just me. Okay. Yeah, I okay. was, <laughs> well, I was <laughs> Cracking the whip. What are you doing? Yeah, Catherine was like, I was actually going to Lizzie's Bio 101 class so that she would pass that while she took the Were you you doing like a parent trap thing? And my dad still wants a tuition refund (laughs) because I went to the required classes Um, for the both of us. And then Catherine was working at like a really cool, I don't even know if it still exists, but a cool restaurant at the time called Parazod's. Oh, yeah. That was um, so good. It was like a big hangout and everyone loved it. And I remember she asked one of the managers there, you know, my sister makes jewelry. You guys are closed on Sunday nights. Can we rent out the back room for a Sunday night? And it was like gangbusters. Wow. Like girls lined up on a Sunday at 5 p.m. to the back room at Parazons to buy jewelry. That's so I think we sold Did out. Did you have food too? Was there was, like a... I think there was food and yeah. drink. No yeah. one was focused on the food and drink. We, <laughs> really? we sold out really quickly, like in 25 minutes. And, and so, um, Catherine, were you like, okay, this is a business? That's when the light bulb kind of clicked. Yeah. When I was like, we 
a, I once had a, a, a mentor, because my background's in finance, that says if you sell out too quickly, it means that you, you didn't priced everything all wrong. <laughs> yeah. uh, so you don't even know the upper limit of where this market lies, because right. how do you know what someone would have paid? We definitely saw an opportunity, or I saw an opportunity then. And I think that was the moment where, even if it was just going to be a college opportunity, because at the time, in sophomore year, we didn't think this would be our right. job after college, <laughs> we still said, like, look, this is a great way to earn money we could do trunk shows two to three times a year it subsidized spring breaks to Paris <laughs> when all of our other friends were like going to Cancun <laughs> and so it really was this sort of amazing way I also think Lizzie and I after a few tailgates were like all right what else does college have to offer so I think creating the fundamentals for this accidental business was partly our destiny it was yeah. a really it, it sort of matched our personalities but and Catherine we, we definitely liked... spearheaded the entrepreneurial side of it I mean I if girls were coming by the room being like are you guys the sisters who make the jewelry? I would be like, oh yeah, you want some here? Have it. Like I would give it away. And Catherine's she like, she would still be giving it away. Was like, um, sign up for this mailing list. We're having a trunk show in three months. Exactly. <laughs> it's really funny. Our old, our old flyers around campus were hot pink with this black Lizzie Fortunato script and a Fleur de Lis logo. Oh my god. Uh, it's evolved a lot, but I mean, I guess we can't <laughs> knock our early brand image too much. But I, it obviously oh, so is funny. a testament to the fact that we started young. It's interesting to go from this almost being a business and then to doing totally different things Absolutely. and then right. coming back to it. I think that we knew there was a promise there, but at least for me personally, I also saw on the flip side, like my parents have given us this extraordinary <laughs> education and they probably didn't spend all this money for us to move to New York and make jewelry and sell it for $50, which at the time, <laughs> like at the time the numbers wouldn't have worked. And I also... I think both of us really loved the courses we took at Duke and I was an economics major and mm -hmm. liked the idea of exploring the finance world. At the time, while it was beautiful that it had turned into something cool, it was sort of a seed and it didn't seem like the obvious thing we would do after school. And I think that we both thought we it would never sustain us. So it was just obvious that like we've got to get a job to pay rent if we want to move to New York. The so, decision was easier for me. Catherine yeah. went and like found a job that she loved and most people are like, oh, you stayed on Wall Street because you got paid a lot, right? And Catherine's like, no, I'm a math nerd and I actually yeah. loved it. <laughs> yeah. Leaving for her was hard. Huh. For me, I was working in fashion PR, which I don't think I knew what it was when oh, I took that job. <laughs> I really did not like it and I was kind of getting as I mentioned this accidental press anyhow because I had friends who were you know interns basically at magazines the bottom of the totem pole and they were helping like get stuff on the pages of magazines and I didn't even have a phone number or a website to list it to but I was getting press and so it was pretty easy for me to make the decision to hop ship I only lasted about 11 months I wasn't making you know any money anyhow so it was and she it had a twin hard. sister who would pay her electric bills. So. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's a few memories of Lizzie coming to, I think it was a summer internship. I was at the floor of the stock exchange and Lizzie shows up in, you know, a short jean skirt. I'm like, Lizzie, there's no <laughs> denim on the stock exchange. <laughs> so um, she, was, she was there to, you know, get rent money or something like that. Catherine, what did you wear when you worked on Wall Street? Was that hard? Lizzie yes. jokes that I still have oh, not God. graduated from a blazer <laughs> and that in my moments of you panic. You are wearing loafers. <laughs> yeah. true. I'm wearing loafers and sort of a, a jacket. It's Dries though. Yeah, actually, exactly. Exactly. I did not wear Dries on Wall Street. But, you know, it is funny. I got a lot of comments from the quintessential Wall Street got bros who were on my desk who I adored but would definitely come in and be like, oh, is it Michael Jackson tribute day? What is that blazer you're wearing? <laughs> or like, oh, you look Amish today. And those were also just very good tailored Philip Lim pieces right, uh, right. 15 years ago. And I remember, I remember, you know, there'd be like a – a sale at Prada or something and I'd go buy fancy high heels because I thought that's what you were supposed to yeah. wear if you worked on Wall Street. So I joke, some of my oldest best pieces in my closet are, are Wall Street pieces. But no, I um, I you think I dress, the, you push I, I push the, the limit for Wall Street, but that's very conservative <laughs> for fashion. Exactly. I remember the first time we went to Paris to show the line, we were doing a trade show and we were like so jet lagged. We had been out really late the night before <laughs> partying with our friends in Paris and the first day of the trade show, we're like running late and I put on some crazy outfit and Catherine goes straight to like a black pantsuit and I was like oh my gosh Catherine you're in Paris like well, wait you I can't believe you that even made it into your suitcase like what are you wearing and it was so funny because we just like have this ongoing joke like Catherine gets nervous and she like just runs for a pantsuit it's true Lizzie Lizzie definitely had to uh loosen me up over the years and teach me that you know the outfit that you wear at 2 p.m at work does not need to be the same outfit you wear at 8 p.m out to dinner yeah. so she's helped the closet evolve a lot
I love it. And will, you, know, will you tell the story work. about how you left your job? Spring of 2008. And I had only, as I said, I had only been there for less than a year. So around month 10 after I started, you know, like a month after and, college. And what were you doing, Lizzie? Like, Yeah, sure. I was an, I was in the accessories department, which was really cool because you a lot everything. of the people I, yeah, and a lot of the people I worked with are now, you know, like accessories editors at Marie Claire at Elle, in style. And they have been tremendously supportive. But I was in the accessories department at Paul Wilmot Communications. Okay. So I was working with some really really high-end luxury clients like we did Nancy Gonzalez handbags we also did a lot of celebrity lines so Gwen Stefani line was with us at that time and Puff Daddy one of Sean Combs <laughs> lines I don't know there was like a lot of celebrity stuff and so for anyone who's interested in like the celebrity culture going out to cool events in New York it would have been a great job yeah. I happen to want to like be in my apartment yeah. making stuff That's on the nightmare. other side the on the other side of the curtain <laughs> so I just wasn't suited to it so I'd been thinking about leaving and thinking you know like I'm not making that much money anyhow but I don't know exactly how this works I feel like I would have to like ask mom and dad for money which I don't want to do and I you know was just like kind of trying to wrap my head all around it and I had spoken to Catherine a lot about it and said like let's try and do this at this point we were still we kind of were like making things and selling things anyhow like we were I can, doing periodic trunk shows in New York but we realized that with two full-time jobs in yeah. New York that was extremely yeah and even though I made hard. no money I worked a lot there were always events every night and like as the lowest person and the job you're the girl standing outside with the clipboard so right. I wouldn't get home until like 1 a.m. and then sometimes I would stay up and make jewelry and have like four hours of sleep and then go back to work the next morning for a job I didn't like so I remember saying to Catherine like if we want to do this more wholeheartedly I just think I need to quit entirely which was so daunting and finding the money whilst you didn't need a ton of money to start a jewelry line a costume jewelry line especially it was still daunting so I left in March of 2008 and that summer I was just trying to like lay the groundwork get things figured out design a first collection and they would pound the pavement around the West Village and go into cute little boutiques and the shop girl would say oh I love your necklace and we'd be like do you we have a coat full of them <laughs> and, uh, as Catherine know, opens her coat ho- hope that maybe the shop girl also would be the boutique owner in some cases <laughs> yeah. and that it actually worked a few stores picked us up on consignment and wow. and Bergdorf found us from one of those stores in the West Village where you know their buyers would come down and scope sort of the up and coming but even getting picked up by a few Village. boutiques like doesn't you know pay the rent right so <laughs> it was it was just a few months later in August of 2008 that was our 24 fourth birthday and Catherine was long gone to work when I woke up because poor girl was working 24 hours a day (laughs) and she had left a card with a note in it saying like I think you need to wholeheartedly do this like don't even consider going to look for other jobs and there was a check for ten thousand dollars saying like let's do this together follow your dream it so makes me cry cry, (laughs) it makes me cry I was probably like too hungover to cry (laughs) no I I mean it was like the most gracious thing that anyone's ever done it was absolutely incredible and it's literally what we started with and it grew so organically from there like we've never raised money we own the entire thing ourselves we are sustainable like that's something that we're so proud of and while we've toyed with different like you know growth opportunities and stuff it's still nice to know that it was founded from that absolutely y'all both recently got married (laughs) <laughs> within three months within the, three months weekend, of each other I, I want to hear about that and I want to hear what you wore okay. absolutely <laughs> absolutely so it's funny because we dated our respective boyfriends now husbands for about 10 years each and oh my so, god really yes my parents thought <laughs> so they're basically yeah. brothers now they're they are brothers. definitely brothers <laughs> I mean, it's re- when you're twin sisters and you spend 30 years living together, it's really hard to break the seal and start living with somebody else. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and we love them, and they put up with the fact that they know that Lizzie and I take our relationship with each other extremely seriously. So Not to mention have a business together. Yeah, so exactly. They are constantly on phone and text or in person with each other. So after dating for 10 years each and our parents being very eager for one or both of us to get married and move along with things, <laughs> Nick and I got engaged and... The day after our engagement party, and this was a little bit planned by by Peter with my permission, Peter proposed to Lizzie when all of our family and friends were in town Aww. for my engagement party. So they, uh, Nick and I got married in May of 2017 in Portugal. We did a destination wedding. Lizzie and Peter got married three months later in August of 2017 to the weekend in upstate New York. But it was funny because my dad was like, no closer than three months. So we did three months to the weekend. <laughs> 
<laughs> like you guys are trying to give me a heart attack. <laughs> and he, he claims that was terrible, but he knows that he was the dad who threw the two best parties of the summer. Exactly. So he is yes. totally proud, <laughs> even though he will tell you that we put him, you know, through the ringer with two weddings in three months. It was, it, we sort of bookended the summer. So we opened the summer with one. And then just as everybody's really sad that summer's coming to an end, we had another huge shebang. That's so awesome. And it, was, uh, so it was, it was really fun because it, you know, brought a lot of the same people together. So I wore a Layla Rose dress. Aww. I wore, obviously, Lizzie Fortunato jewelry. Lizzie got engaged at Bariachino. Exactly. Yeah, like, you yeah. know, that's Lila's favorite restaurant. I did not <laughs> know that. It oh, is. my gosh. That's so funny. That is amazing. That's I, one of our favorite restaurants. We are such <laughs> admirers from afar. We don't know her personally, oh. so you'll have to connect us someday. Yeah. Oh, yeah. she's the coolest. Um, yeah. So but I, in her, I mean, the, those wedding gowns are Oh, they're amazing. And, yeah, awesome. I, oh, I sort of had this feeling that, I always knew that I wanted that. And sure enough, you start looking and there's a million options out there and it kind of becomes this crazy, obviously, industry. But I found a dress I loved. I don't think I overthought it too much. I wore Lizzie Fortunato Jewels. Um, <laughs> I wore a Wes Gordon dress for my rehearsal dinner, which Aww. is obviously so special now that he's at Carolina yeah. Herrera. I wore a beautiful... And was it white? Um it was like a creamy, white. a cream white. Love, it was white. Don't yeah. you white. I love when brides yeah. do that. Yeah. Totally. It was, so it was really good. And a, and a really great floral Lizzie Fortunato headband. That was the coolest Aww. piece that obviously never made it into production because <laughs> it was really over the top. But it worked perfectly for my yeah. rehearsal. And a Gigi Burris custom veil. Aww. So, you know, the beauty of being so in this nice. industry is you have a lot of friends who want to come out and support you. Oh, and an Irene Newworth engagement ring. Aww. So, you know, really <laughs> surrounded by truly our friends and mentors yeah. and people who have done everything from late night drinks when you're, you know, moaning about the industry to your CFDA recommendation letters to, you know, your sort of fangirl crushes of other people whose business you want to emulate. Yeah. And we really, I think, get to practice what we preach by wearing and celebrating those people too. It was really yeah. neat. I didn't necessarily plan on making my own dress, but I ended up making my own dress. We do the embroidery for our leather goods in India, and one of the embroidery houses has an office in New York, and I was there one day. They do exquisite work. So I was in their office and found this incredible swatch of metallic embroidery that I loved, and the girl who I work with there like knows the price point of our bags. I was like, don't look at that. That's <laughs> just not going to happen on your bags. And I was like, I'm getting married. And she's like, it's hot pink. And I was like, well, you guys could make it in any color. Like, this is what you do. So I, one of my friends, um, Jenny Cupano, who I think you know, she had been at Philip Lim for a while. She's now at Sakai. And her friend at Philip Lim was a pattern maker. So I worked with him and we kind of like designed a pattern knowing that we would embroider the entire bodice. And we like went to B&J and got like a beautiful <laughs> silk and he built the whole pattern. And it was a fitted bodice with like um, kind of a billowy skirt. And then we sent all the silk pieces and I like hoped and prayed because we were like <laughs> cutting it down to the wire and occasionally some stuff will come back from India with like a pen mark on it or a fingerprint on it. But I sent these pieces of white silk that were going to be assembled into the bodice to India and they embroidered them with the metallic embroidery uh, but they did it in shades of like cream and bronze. It was so cool. Oh, how beautiful. And then it came back about a month before the wedding date and he <laughs> sewed it and it was perfect. And now actually I have to say I am consider it's so cool and I want to wear it again so I'm considering cutting it off and making it into a, like a peplum top because I just I want to yeah. be able to enjoy it it's in my closet and it's like so cool and we worked so hard on it together it was so much fun but um I don't know I'm like where where debating. where are both of them now mine's they're both in our respective yeah. apartment closets and the mandatory you know dry cleaning bag <laughs> yeah they're in the like closet. the king's cleaner bag and still <laughs> haven't been touched so I might do something with mine we'll yeah. say but it was it was really such like a fun project were you sort of planning them obviously at the same time yeah it was surprisingly <laughs> uh, peaceful <laughs> peaceful and 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 actually like synergetic in all the right ways mm -hmm. I mean it, it we were really lucky that one was destination one was local yeah. the vibes were a little different the outfit shopping kind of it was double the fun as opposed to both saying like oh I want that same dress and I think for being twins and always being highly coordinated we definitely have unique styles so there was never a moment where we were you know having a cat fight over both wanting the same pair of white <laughs> yeah. shoes or something I think like I'm that. A cat fight uh, ever. And, and you can probably speak to this too, but like when you do have your own business that requires so much of your attention, there's almost like a limit on how much time you, you can, can expend think. worrying about other stuff. So like we were yeah. both super involved in our wedding planning, but we didn't deliberate about things as much as I thought we would have. And partly it's because like, okay, we have a very full-time job. Like I can't right. spend so much time <laughs> deliberating over like these napkins. And so yeah. we were pretty decisive on our planning. The best events, whether they're a wedding or just a 
dinner party and when everybody really loves you and you totally. love everybody yeah. it can't go it wrong. can't go wrong I mean, like that was, I mean, that was, it like gives me shivers like both of both of our weddings were just like so much fun it's the kind of party you want to have like every single year because there was just so much love in the room at both of them oh. absolutely and there <laughs> it didn't matter what you were wearing at that moment even yeah. though the fashions at both wedding were pretty epic um, <laughs> but it didn't matter okay. what you were wearing because it was it, there was obviously so much joy in the room and it's I mean we've gotten to share that together with the capital 20 year with 10 year festivities but obviously yeah. this, being surrounded by a lot of great creatives and business people in in our professional careers has been sort of a similar parallel of if it's not bringing us joy it's not worth doing yeah, yeah. and and being around people that really want the best for you which totally. is totally like, totally my favorite question is um what did you wear to the prom <laughs> My story is actually good because despite the fact that I've landed myself in a fashion shop, growing up, I hated shopping. It was this terrible, visceral thing where my mom would take us to the gap on like, you know, the go back to school shopping. And my mom would be like, here, you need this jean jacket. Lizzie needs this jean jacket. I'm like, temper tantrum on the floor. I don't need a new jean jacket, mom. My jean jacket from last year was completely fine. I don't know if it was I was an anti-consumer that I... (laughs) I didn't want my parents spending the money. I don't know what it was. It went into finance. Meanwhile, I'm like, I'll take hers. I'll (laughs) take two. Exactly. (laughs) So sure enough, in very Catherine Fortunato fashion, prom rolls around. And this wasn't senior prom. At our school, I think you got to go as a junior or something. So it was the year before senior prom. And... My mom said, we got to go get your dress. It's a month before. We've got to get your dress. And said, mom, I don't need a dress. I'll wear something I have. <laughs> I don't need a dress. <laughs> In quintessential form. And day of prom, I decide I need a dress. Oh day of. I mean, I was just totally, what a miserable kid to have on the day of prom. <laughs> so so wait, I, were you freaking out the whole time? Or were you just kind of like. No, I probably had it lined up like four months in advance. But and were you I, asking her, like, oh, what are you wearing? I don't um, think you cared about my I don't destiny. think I care. I think I was like very selfish with my own fashion choice. I was just like consumed about like whether my nail polish would match or something good luck lady (laughs) (laughs) i end up my mom is such a saint because we found a black and white checked was it laundry i don't know but it was so chic and we still have it black and white checked floor length it was like black and white gingham like michael gores did three years ago yes and i (laughs) cut it 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 was just sort of like a you know, like a sweetheart, sweetheart like spaghetti strap, strap, fitted bodice, and then like a really with a cool. Oh, thing. How I mean, it was pretty classy for being day of, and my mom had to get it hemmed day of as well. <laughs> I mean, she was really bless that woman. Really yeah. was so so good that day and every day. <laughs> anyway, Lizzie's right. We cut it off a few years ago, and that dress is still in my closet, and it still fits. Ooh, oh, look at you! <laughs> I should have worn it tonight. Uh, <laughs> did you have accessories? Accessory I'm ladies. Sure, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure you made us some accessories. Yeah, and, I don't but we've got to pull were. up pictures because that that will be one of our to-dos for pictures for and you guys. She, do you remember yeah. the um, shoes? Yes. I, wasn't Via Spiga really big when we were in high school? Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure I wore Via Spiga shoes. High heels? Yeah. High heels. Oh, yeah. Because Lizzie and I think that we're short. And I guess we at 5'4", we are a little bit short. And, um, at the time, I we never were really noticed. short. I think we were like, you know. 5'2". Five five, exactly. 4'9". Four yeah. four um, <laughs> and so we, we, yeah, we, when it was time to dress up, we always thought that heels were the way to go. Because, you know, <laughs> you're a junior in high school and that's what you do. Yeah. Heels, eyeshadow, hair straightener. You know. Did you do your oh, hair? Did you, what about your I'm hair? I'm sure we got our hair done. Yeah. But. We have a joke with our best girlfriend who now lives in Charleston that every year the primping time would get earlier and earlier when you would start. (laughs) And sure enough, her brother in true fashion was like, the day of our weddings, I think we probably started, you know, the night before. And he's like, (laughs) well, it follows suit that you uh, added another 12 hours to the uh, lead up time for primping. But that's just the most fun part. It's like more fun. Getting ready is always the best part of the entire event. So. um so though no, those habits started very young. Yeah. So my prom dress memory is that I made it, and I also still own it, but I probably don't fit into it. And it was lavender raw silk, Ooh, V-neck fitted long, and it was so pretty. And I think it got passed around to a bunch of our friends, like who also <laughs> wore it to their proms and stuff because it sleeveless was like too? yeah, sleeveless. sleeveless. It was like so classic. And I did wear a really cool necklace, which I didn't make that my mom had bought, and it was like this iridescent ribbon with huge beads on it. Ooh, how pretty. Yeah. So. I don't know. It's like one of my best Super early cheap. looks. Like, that was really good. <laughs> it was good. I do remember, and I, I feel like we were talking about this earlier, we were asking if we had any issues planning the weddings in sync with each other. And Lizzie and I really have rarely ever fought about our outfits, but there was one one Father's Day or Easter or some sort of like occasion mini where occasion. You go out to lunch. <laughs> that. And my mom had come home with two dresses and Lizzie and I laid eyes both on the green floral with the off the shoulder straps and there are very few fights that we can remember like for the books and that green dress was one of them (laughs) and Catherine won which is so unusual (laughs) 
<laughs> it's wait, wait, true. When, when Ming's got the, got the dress? Yeah, she got to wear Ming's the dress. Like, I had to wear okay. the other one that my mom got, which we don't even remember. That's we have no memory of the other dress. <laughs> but that green dress with the off-the-shoulder steps, there were tears. My parents Aww. could not understand why we both obsessed over the same one, but we, we so did funny. have one dress fight mm-hmm. in about... 25 years ago and uh <laughs> and, and neither of us have forgotten about it thank you all so much for being here it, it is such so a pleasure much. yeah it's so fun to be here thank and you. laura thank you for all the support oh <laughs> love awesome. you gals we love, love you what we wore is produced by capital and balto creative media the original song someone so enchanting was composed and performed by brit drazda QueenCityPodcastNetwork.com. dot com.